Will you please remain standing, if you don't mind, please? Because uh, before we start the full council, I'd like to do two things. And the first one is to do a minute silence on behalf of two ex-councillors, Kevin Kelly and Brenda Pearson. And we will do one minute silence, and then after that, I would like to do a separate one minute silence for our beloved ex ceremonial mayor, Brenda, who was buried yesterday. So if everybody's in agreement with that. Okay, thank you. When you're ready, please. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues, for that first minute. We will now do the second minute for Councillor Brenda Lawrence. Thank you. I thank you all for that. Would you please be seated? Before we uh, fully start uh, on our agenda this evening, I want to read um, a card that I received from County Durham's Lieutenant, Mrs. Sue Snowden. Um, Her Majesty's Lord Lieutenant. And she said unto me, and I'll just read exactly what it says. Councillor Rob Cook, Deputy Mayor of Hartlepool Borough and colleagues. It was with deep sadness that I received news of Councillor Brenda Lyons' death. A very special lady, courageous, determined throughout her illness to continue her civic duties. What an incredible example to us all. She was a superb ambassador for the town and borough and will be greatly missed. It was my privilege and pleasure to have known her. Signed, Sue. As you all know, um, Brenda was buried yesterday and it was, the church was full, the crematorium was full and afterwards at the cricket club that was full where people couldn't even see it. It was unbelievable how many people actually turned out to give their due respects to Brenda. I would like now to give you as members of this council the opportunity to say a few words if you so wish uh, and that that could mean all of you or just a few of you. If you feel you want to say something, I will give you that opportunity as of now. So I'll, I'll, I'll just do it randomly, right? So don't think I'm giving preference to anybody or otherwise, okay? Councillor Lyons. 
Uh, Harrison. Yes, we shared a name, Brenda. Um, and I think we shared a few other things as well. I think that the tribute uh, to her yesterday, the funeral, unfortunately I was unable to um, participate in anything after the church, but I felt that the service at the church um, just summed her up. And it was really to do with the fact that um, it stressed the family side of Brenda, um, the friend side of Brenda, and the work that she's done locally to help the residents and the wider town. So I really think that the service and the tribute led by Denise um, was very appropriate, very apt. Um, and I think that the, the, the support that was there, I'm hoping, um, and I have said it, I, I hope that Dennis and the family get good support from yesterday um, and everybody who really w wanted to um, show their support. And I know that there were people who would have liked to have been there, but obviously not everybody could be. But I think we were all there in spirit, and it was a, a lovely tribute, and I don't think I can add to the kind of thing that it was. Thank, Thank you, you, Brenda. I will just use first names right, so I don't say her name again. So, Mike. Uh, thanks, Rob. Um, really difficult. Um, Brenda was a, a fantastic person who cared very much about every decision that she made uh, in this place. She was someone who I went to for many reasons, support, uh, discipline, because we all know I need that sometimes, uh, for friendly reassurance and guidance. These things you could find with Brenda at any time of any day. We are much worse off as a borough for her loss. Uh, my first interaction with Brenda was way back uh, on the campaign trail when I very first started taking an interest. Uh, the one thing you could rely on with Brenda uh, is knowledge of the rural West patch, which I had zero of and she had a, an abundance of. My first campaign session uh, with her and Den uh, was about five hours long uh, because I had lots of questions uh, and slowed the whole process down. It was educating. Uh, and it was a, a great insight into uh, her worth, work ethic. Um, she understood people's needs, she understood where people were coming from and she took time to do that. Uh, I can also vouch for her uh, fantastic hospitality, uh, which regularly, regularly involved uh, biscuits, drinks of tea and diet coke, uh, and the odd takeaway if things were, were, were running over. I mentioned earlier the word discipline, uh, Brenda prided herself on the way she interacted with people. Everyone was given the same respect, care and attention. But if you were seen by Brenda to border on being a bit rowdy, or in my case, heckle a little bit, uh, Brenda would make sure you calmed down. Uh, I fondly gave her the role of chief shin kicker uh, when I first started uh, as a counsellor, uh, and, and she uh, took full advantage of that. Since 2019, Brenda has been mayor and the chair of these meetings. As mayor, she's, given a, she's been a huge ambassador for the town, attending as many events, civic or otherwise, as was humanly possible. Post-COVID regulations, she was back to attending uh, events and holding her own charity events for her chosen charities. Even in poor health, she's chaired these meetings and has done so with huge dignity and respect. Never frustrated in her role and always good-spirited. The last, <clears throat> the last phone call I had with Brenda was business as usual, <laughs> offering support to me, asking if I was looking after myself, talking about the ward, and we had a bit of a laugh about things that had been happening in our respective lives outside of council matters. Brenda, you were a great friend to me, and you are missed. Thank you. John? Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to share with Council uh, a very brief story of perhaps the most unusual experience I had um, running into Brenda. I used to work in Newcastle, and it's a horrendous stretch of road, A19, when you're travelling down at late at night in the middle of winter. And one such evening, 
as I was travelling down, I noticed up ahead a car stopped in the outside lane and the prone body of a motorcyclist splayed across the road who'd clearly been uh, injured. And there was someone leaning over him. So obviously I stopped too. I jumped out. I ran up and up from the, up from the person. It was Brenda. So she said, all right, Jonathan, how are you? She started having a chat with me on the A19, asked me how my daughter was, um, who had not long been born. Um, while at the same time taking care of this person who was obviously in, in great need and Dennis was there as well. And I think that kind of summed up Brenda in some respects, the lightness of touch but looking to give support. I think the only thing I want to say for, from, a, from a councillor perspective is what she embodied in the chair, which has not always been embodied by chairs but it certainly was by her, was an absolute sense of fairness. Um, she gave me more rope than I think many people in this room wished I had been given at various different times. Um, and she did it out of a spirit of fairness and fair play and treating both sides absolutely equally and the neutrality and the independence that comes with the role. So almost that, those two things are the things that I'll remember the most about. Um, obviously our thoughts go to Dennis and, and the family. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Anybody else wish to comment? So. Brenda, she always had time for everyone, each and every one, didn't matter what politics we followed. She supported many charity events um, during her time as councillor when other mayors had put on such occasions. Her family was everything, and this is when I met her over 30 years ago when Mandy was having Andrew. Our little family catch-ups when she asked everybody always asked how the family was and the boys were, and more recently, Grace will be sadly missed. Jed? Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, three or four comments about um, Brenda Lines. Um, if a uh, local historian would correct me that she was in for three years rather than well, two years and nine months, maybe a record, and maybe in the minds of people here who know Brenda Lines. Um, I was in the um, various committees with the Licensing Committee and Audit and Governance. Uh, contributions were excellent, and um, she tried to um, install maternity services in Hartlepool, and, uh, and that's a tribute to Brenda Lines. And recent months, uh, I'm amazed the fantastic courage and resolution from Brenda Lines. I mean, she was into the meeting in a wheelchair. Uh, even the um, senator, wreath on the cenotaph, was with help with husband Dennis. And uh, astounding courage. And she's missing. She's missing in the count at the moment. And. Uh, she will be remembered as chair. Thank you. Anybody else wish to say anything? Thank you. I'll, I'll just add something myself, if I may. Um, I've known Brenda for approximately 20 years, and the first impression I got of Brenda was that she was a very easygoing lady. And then I found out to my detriment that that wasn't necessarily the case if you didn't get what you wanted. And um, I know Denise mentioned it in uh, a eulogy yesterday about the alley gates. And I remember that because I was on the Neighbourhood uh, Services Committee at the time. But Brenda was, she was a new, unique lady. She suffered cancer in 2015 and then she was lucky enough to ring the bell of being in remission. However, it came back in 2020 and I can say this with my hand on my heart and I mean this, she was the most brave, courageous lady I've ever met. She never moaned in all the time that she was suffering. She just got on with it. Now, I spoke to Den yesterday, as many people did, and he told me 
exactly how our last few days had, had gone. And eventually she just passed away peacefully. Um, but I just want to remember her as she was, a very bubbly, pleasant, brave and courageous lady. And she is sadly missed, I know, by all of us. And all I will wish is that Den and all her family can get together and get through this together. So thank you, everybody, for your comments and attendance. We will now start officially with full council. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. Receive any apologies for absence, please. Yes, Chair. We've got apologies from Councillors Cassidy, Cowie, Dennis Lyons, Councillor Riddle, Carl Richardson and Amy Prince. Are there any others? No, thank you. Receive any declarations of interest by members? None. Uh, item three deals with any business required by statute. There's none. Item four, can we approve the minutes of the last meeting held on the 16th of December as being a true record? Thank you. As this matter's arising, the next one, Councillor Body. Thank you, Chair. Oh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, as you are today. Um, as you probably recall, I asked a question on the uh, general manager's business report last council meeting with regard to contextual safeguarding. And the uh, director was kind enough to send me a reply, which in a sense assuaged my anxieties, because my anxiety is we'd got a £146,000 grant as the lead authority and I wondered if that indicated that we had um, contextual safeguarding issues in Hartlepool. Just for clarity, contextual safeguarding is abuse or um, the inappropriate use of children or young people by members of the public, i.e. non-family members. And I think there's been much in the press recently with regard to trafficking of particularly young girls in their early and mid-teens. So it was reassuring to hear that the grant had been awarded because of the very good work of our officers and not because of the high instance of contextual abuse in Hartlepool. However, while Sally's reply was very full, it didn't actually cover everything because I was interested to know if there was an issue with contextual safeguarding in Hartlepool. I assume that there isn't a major issue, but I would be very um, reassured to know if we do have any children on the safeguarding register or young people on the safeguarding register who are registered because of contextual abuse because if we do, I think we need to step up our attempts to ensure that the young people of Hartlepool are entirely safe. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Boddy. I'll um, take that back with the Director and I'm sure the Chair of Children's will comment, but it might be something for the discussion in the Children's Services Committee. But I will make sure that you get that information, Councillor Boddy. Uh, yes, Councillor. Can I just answer Councillor Body on that regards in relation to contextual safeguarding? Go on. Is that on? Yes. Right, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Uh, you had a reply of um, Sally, yeah, which I'd asked her to give you after you raised this at the last meeting. Yeah. I do have regular catch-ups, and in relation to uh, press information regarding contextual safeguarding, yeah, I was reassured of Sally 
that everything's in order. You don't need to know on a, an individual basis. It's a collective issue. And I, as I say, I have regular meetings with her and she's assured me that we're on top of the issues. And if I need to know, she'll tell me and that will be passed on you know, in terms of confidentiality. Thank, thank you, Councillor Lenridge. Are there any other items on the minutes that need clarification? No. Thank you. Item six, uh, to deal with any business required by statute. There's none. There's no announcements from myself or from yourself, Denise. Thank you. Um, we we'll go to item eight, to dispose of business remaining from the last meeting, and that's the periodic review of the Council's constitution. And that's you, Hale, when you're ready, please. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Um, this report is um, in relation to the review of the council procedure rules, which um, at the last meeting in December had to stand um, adjourned to this meeting. So basically, this is a procedural issue for members just to um, note that these rules will now be adopted and um, put into the constitution. Thank you. Okay, so has that been noted? Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Item nine, um, reports from council committees to receive questions. There's none. Item 10, uh, business specified in the summons of the meeting. There is none. We we'll go to item 11, which is to consider reports from the policy committees. Uh, item A, proposal in relation to the council's approved budget and policy framework. Number one, medium term financial strategy. Shane, are you ready, please? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I apologise if my teeth chatter halfway through this because I'm absolutely freezing at the moment. Um, the detailed report was considered by Finance and Policy Committee on the 14th of February, and I am assuming that everybody has read this, so we'll not go through it in detail. I will, however, highlight just a few key issues, Chair. Firstly, as set out in the report, national, uh, national increases in spending power are still reliant on increasing council tax and the adult social care precept as this makes up 40% in the increase of spending power. The remaining 60% comes from government grant. Locally, the percentages are 36% and 64% as we get more grant to equalise the amount received from, sorry, raised from the adult social care precept. Secondly, the budget for 22-23 is balanced from a combination of increasing council tax, the adult social care precept, approved saving proposals and an, and an increase in government funding. Thirdly, this package reduces the, def uh, the deficit deferred to 23-24 to 1.086 million compared to the deficit deferred last year of 5.182 million. This means we've put the budget on a much more sustainable basis, although we still face financial challenges in 23-24 and 24-25. I hope that when we start developing a plan to address these deficits, everybody comes forward with positive proposals. Finally, the budget proposals to remove the school crossing patrol saving and provide an additional £86,000 to local welfare support, specifically for gas and electric top-ups. The report also covers capital issues and the statutory council tax calculations which is an administrative responsibility as the police, fire and parish council tax levels have been set independently. I would therefore move the recommendations set uh, out in section 5 of the report. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any comments? If not, we will go to a recorded vote on this particular issue. No? I'll, yes? sec I'll second it then, Deputy uh, Thank you. Uh, we will now have a recorded vote, if we can, please. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. <clears throat> so, uh, this is for or against the uh, recommendations in the report. Councillor Ashton? Four. Councillor Boddy? Yes. Councillor Brash? Yes. Councillor Brown? Four. Councillor Clayton? Against. Councillor Cook? Four. Councillor Cranny? Four. Councillor Creevy? Councillor Elliott? 
Against. Councillor Falconer. For. Councillor Feeney. Against. Councillor Fleming. Sorry, was that a four? four. Councillor Groves. For. Councillor Hall. Yeah. Councillor Hargreaves. Against. Councillor Harrison. Yeah. Councillor Howson. Councillor Jackson. For. Councillor Lindridge. For. Councillor Little. For. Councillor Moore. For. Councillor David Nicholson. For. Councillor Veronica Nicholson. For. Councillor Picton. For. Councillor Price. For. Councillor Smith. Councillor Stokel. For. Councillor Young. Sorry, Chair. Um, Chief Solicitor is just advising that we need to do two votes on this one, section 5.1 and 5.2. So that was for yes. 5.1. Yes. So it was 18 votes for and 10 votes against. So we'll now do. So oh, that sorry. is approved. That's um, we can go to the housing revenue account. No, the statutory council. Ca sorry, Chair. Oh, 5 sorry, my, my apologies. Yep. So it's just process. We have to do it two right. different ways. So we need another um, recorded vote. So. When you're ready, please. Unfortunately, we've got to do legally a, a, a registered vote for both. I do, it, I, I do appreciate the difficulties in it. So it's um, 5.2, the statutory ca council tax calculation. Chair, would it be help if I can just, um, just for the benefit of everybody, the second recommendation is basically just the statutory calculations. It's to whether or not you agree that the chief financial officer is correctly calculated the amount of properties in the town or not. Where is he? He's here. He's behind. Have you done it correctly? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, that's the reason. So we need to have another recorded vote. Sorry, sorry, yeah. I can't hear you, Pam. Oh. Yes, Jonathan. It, this is the formal setting of the council tax, isn't it, to give yes. it a more popular um, yeah. description? It's a statutory council tax yeah. calculations yes. confirming yeah. that the chief finance officer. Yes. So every no, everybody knows so you, what they're so, going to So you can for, only go it? against it if you think the chief finance officer can't add up. <laughs> you, you and a few others, Jonathan. <laughs> so can we go at the recorded vote, please, colleagues? Councillor Ashton. Four. Councillor Body. Councillor Brash. Councillor Brown. Four. Councillor Clayton. Councillor Cook. Four. Councillor Cranny. Four. Councillor Creevy. Councillor Elliot. Against. Councillor Faulkner. Four. Councillor Feeney. Against. Councillor Fleming. Four. Councillor Groves. Four. Councillor Hall. Yeah. Councillor Hargreaves. Against. Councillor Harrison. Yeah. Councillor Howson. Sorry, Councillor Howson, I couldn't hear. Councillor Jackson. Four. Councillor Lindridge. Four. Councillor Little. Four. Councillor Moore. Chief Financial Officer will be pleased to know I have confidence in him. Four. Councillor David Nicholson. Four. Councillor Veronica Nicholson. Four. Councillor Picton. Four. Councillor Price. Four. Councillor Smith. Four. Councillor Stokel. Councillor Young. It's 1810 again. Same as last time, Chair. Thank Council you. 1810, the vote's carried. Thank you very much indeed for that, colleagues. Uh, item B, proposals from departure from the approved budget and policy framework. Pardon? Right. 
Sorry? Yes. When you're ready, please, Shane, if you would, please. Um, so the report reminds members that the HRA is a ring-fenced account and that, it has to, and that it has to fund all expenditure, including loan repayments and repairs from rental income. This means that if we want a sustainable housing revenue account and to increase the number of good quality homes, we need to maintain rental income. We froze rents in the last two years and we were the only North East Council operating a HRA to do so. Other North East Councils, which have uh, much more properties as they do not, did not transfer their stock, have more financial resilience and they did not freeze their rents. Four councils increased their rents by 4.2% over two years and one council increased uh, by 1.5% over two years. For 22-23 Chair, three councils have proposed a rent increase of 4.1%, two councils have proposed an increase of 4.1% subject to final approval, 13 group have approved a rent in income increase sorry, of 4.1%, and these increases are in line with the government's current rent policy, which is designed to support financial sustainability of HRAs and other social housing providers. Chair, we cannot continue to freeze rents if we want to grow our HRA and provide more good quality homes for our residents. As the report highlights, we have ambitious plans to increase the number of properties from 305 as they are today to 460 over the next few years, and this won't happen if we don't protect rental income. The Finance and Policy Committee received clear advice from the Director of Resources and Development that a 4.1% rent increase provides the most robust and sustainable basis for the HRA and continued delivery of the Council housing objectives. I fully appreciate that houses, uh, households sorry, are facing significant inflationary pressures. However, after freezing rents for two years, we cannot maintain this position if we want a sustainable HRA. I would therefore move, Chair, that the recommendations detailed in Section 4 of the report are taken. Thank you, Councillor. Anybody wish to make any comments? No? Well, we will go to a recorded vote. I'll Sorry. second it, Chair. Thank you. We will go to a record. Oh. You wish to say something, Councillor? Oh, go on. Sorry, Pam. Yeah. Oh, I, I was actually pointing out Mike initially, but I will say something. Um, in the same way that I did at the Finance and Policy Committee, um, I think we all share the aspiration of the local authority wanting to have more uh, houses that it can rent as a, as a responsible landlord. I think we all do, and I think we would all want to see massive investment in those properties so that they are nice places for people to live. I think the issue with this particular um, uh, increase is the timing of it right now in this year when we've got, as we've just well, the majority of us um, agreed the, the, the medium financial term strategy is that we are increasingly putting the burden on the people who can least afford to pay these things. You know, we've got an increase in council tax, we've got an increase in national insurance, we've got an increase in cost of living, we've got an increase in fuel, we've got an increase in, well, dare I say, it, mobile phone costs. I had my little uh, RPI increase uh, text the other day. We've got an increase in broadband costs all the way along as an increase. And I do, I do absolutely share the aspiration to build more council houses, but that cannot be the target that we chase at the expense of the people who live in those homes. If they cannot afford to live in those homes or live comfortably or live in a way that means they can feed their children properly, then really chasing that target is just an empty target. It's a bit like saying, you know, there's nothing so useless as doing that which should not be done at all. If we, if we, that we cannot just chase a number, we have to think about the people who live there and their quality of life. And I just, for, in all conscience, given the, the timing of it, I really don't think this is the year to be putting an increased burden through this increase. Thank you, Councillor. Any other comments? Councillor Young? Uh, it's more of a question, Chair, to, to, to uh, the Chair of uh, Finance and Policy. What would happen if uh, the HRA was to go into deficit, or is it allowed to go into deficit? Chair. Chair, the HRA isn't supposed to run at the deficit, and they can't run at a deficit for a medium to long term. 
Um, the reality of the situation is that if it does run in a deficit, the Chief Financial Officer was very clear that if that happens, then uh, future house building will have to stop. And whilst I fully get the, a lot of the comments that Councillor Hargreaves was making there, as was pointed out in finance and policy, we have hundreds if not thousands of residents of this town that are currently living in substandard privately rented accommodation that are charged much higher rents um, than we currently charge for our properties. And my sincere wish is for us to continue developing houses, not just to meet uh, an arbitrary figure and a target that we're aiming at, the, the reason for building more houses is so that we can provide houses for those residents that are living in substand, uh, substandard properties and get their rents down to our levels. Thank you. Yes, Mike. Sorry, Shane. Uh, just a follow-up question to that. Um, in terms of the rent that's being paid by those particular residents in, in our council uh, houses, um, is that subsidised from anywhere else? Uh, yes, Chair. Approximately two-thirds of our, our tenants receive all or part of their rent paid for by um, benefits, Chair. Thank you. Yes, Pam. Um, it was really just to uh, commend um, the Leader of the Council and uh, Councillor Mike Young on a beautifully orchestrated uh, performance, really, Chair. Just wanted to say it was, ex just wanted to say it was excellently done. Moss. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was intrigued and somewhat flabbergasted to hear the Leader of the Council state, and I wrote it down immediately, we have hundreds if not thousands of properties, substandard was the word he used. Now, if that's the case, and what we are trying to do, I would think if we are um, increasing our portfolio of council housing is to ensure that doesn't happen. So my question is quite simply this. Why don't we have a register of landlords so we can ensure that substantial properties are not the case for hundreds and thousands of tenants in Hartlepool? Shared. Um yeah, that's one way of looking at it, but the other way is to disrupt the market and provide a much better product, and that's exactly what I would prefer to do, because we can provide a product that's better and cheaper, and that's what we're trying, that's the policy that we're going down, Chair. Thank you. Yes, John. Why not do both? Why not provide these great houses that disrupts the market and regulate the end of the market that's letting people down? There's no good reason not to do it, and they've voted against it at least three times now. I just want to pick up one point, though. Uh, the leader of the council said, you know, the negative impact is, is, is lessened by universal credit covering some or part, though it's a very woolly phrase, some or part. Who knows what that really means in reality? But I would point to the actual report that says this will have a negative impact in poverty terms for young people aged 18 to 21. It will have a negative impact to those who are under it will have a negative impact on children and families born into poverty. Our own report is saying this will make child poverty worse in our town in 2022. Um, so on that basis, you can have all the excuses you want. I'm not voting for something that makes child poverty worse. Our own report, prepared by our professional officers, says this recommendation will make child poverty worse. Any other comments? Do we have a seconder for the... Thank you. Uh, we need to go to a recorded vote again. Are you ready, please, Denise? Thank you, Chair. Sorry, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Ashton. Full. Councillor Boddy. Against. Councillor Brash. Against. Councillor Brown. For. Councillor Clayton. Against. Councillor Cook. Councillor Cranny. For. Councillor Creevy. Councillor Elliot. Against. Councillor Falconer. For. Councillor Feeney. Against. Councillor Fleming. For. Councillor Groves. For. Councillor Hall. Yeah. Councillor Hargreaves. Against. 
Councillor Harrison. Yes. Councillor Housen. Councillor Jackson. Yes. Councillor Lindridge. Yes. Councillor Little. Four. Councillor Moore. Four. Councillor David Nicholson. Four. Councillor Veronica Nicholson. Four. Councillor Pigton. Against. Councillor Price. Councillor Smith. Councillor Storkel. Councillor Young. Yeah, we've got 15 for 13 against. That is carried. Thank you, colleagues. Can we move on to our next item, which is uh, 11B, uh, departure from the approved budget and policy framework, and there's nothing on that. So we will move to 12 uh, to consider motions in the order in which the notice has been received. Um, this has been received from the uh, Labour Group. Who's proposing, Jonathan? Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, a slight change of plan, um, and I'll give a very brief uh, explanation. Um, reflecting, actually reflecting on what often gets said to us by members opposite um, about this, uh, often what we find ourselves doing in these parts of the meeting is very few words, sorry, very many words and very few actions. And I think we need to start changing that. So I just want to say tonight um, we're, we're looking to make some actions rather than words. So I can confirm that we've told the chief solicitor, uh, the chief solicitor, I do apologise, the chief financial officer by email just before the meeting that the Labour Group, which receives one SRA, has decided to revoke it to the tune of 100% um, to go into the local welfare support fund, that any future Labour Council will cut. SRAs by 50% and any future Labour chair will only accept 50% of the current level. So with those actions, <coughs> rather than words, and under Rule 11.3 of the Constitution and with the agreement of all the signatories of the motion, I withdraw it. Thank you. That's withdrawn. We will move on uh, to... Um, 12.2 that full council agrees to write to Jill Mortimer to request us sorry is that oh sorry my, my apologies yes the second motion uh, the full council agrees to write to Jill Mortimer MP to request their support in lobbying parliament for local authorities to be given more powers to take control of derelict buildings and sites that ruin our communities and stifle economic growth. I've read it, so... <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to say anything, anyway, you've spoke too much already. So, do you I, wish I, to, I'll second it. <laughs> do, you, do you wish to add anything to the motion, uh, Chair? Just very briefly, Chair. Um, to, to be honest, this is uh, something that affects pretty much every ward in the town. Uh, I don't think there isn't a ward that doesn't have um, something in there, that uh, a building in there or a piece of land that doesn't cause elected members and residents a nightmare on a very regular basis. Um, and indeed, some of them have sadly been around since Stuart Drummond uh, coined them grot spots. So it's frustrating, and I find it extremely frustrating, Chair, both as a um, a ward member and as the leader of the council that a lot of the time the private individuals who are companies who own these pieces of land know how to play the system and the council are always on the back foot not just this council but councils across uh, the land and unfortunately the public often feel that the council can and should just be able to go in flatten it and redevelop when we all know in reality unfortunately that isn't the case and the law is stacked against us. So, Chair, I know I've spoken to many members and plenty who haven't signed this uh, motion at the time and may I just apologise to those, to everybody who might have signed this. Um, the reason I didn't go out, I'll, I'll be honest here, the reason I didn't ask other people if they wanted to sign it is I 
forgot to send it in um, and it was running late so yeah so I do apologize um, but anyway it, it, it's really we need to do something and we're, we're really urging our local MP to take this debate to Parliament because something has to be done it can't be changed on a local level and it must be done at a national level uh, and our MP is a person to take that fight up thank you we have uh, numbers of uh, members who wish to speak if you bear with me one second Pam, when you're ready please thank you chair um, I think it's already been seconded but if it hadn't I, I would love to second I'm happy to um, I mean I think you know this is exactly um, an instance where this council can be completely united and I think uh, you know I would 100% support it as I'm sure all of our, my colleagues will for the reasons that you have um, eloquently stated um, Councillor Moore and, and what's more I think if a letter is to go could I suggest that it carries all of our um, signatures if that is if you would be willing to accept that um, I think it's, it's, it's an absolute blight in all of our communities I mean in my ward to name just a couple Manor House um, that Councillor Clayton and I have been fighting on and Tony Hansen has had weekly emails about um, in the Hourglass pub which um, we took the chief exec to I mean that is just an absolute I mean it's, it's, a, it's an accident waiting to happen but it's a complete eyesore for all those residents that live in the vicinity um, particularly the elderly people who live in the, the bungalows opposite and again we've been fighting on that for some time um, so completely 100% support it happy to second it um, and would like to put our signatures to that letter um, and let's hope that we get some support from our MP. Thank you. Brenda? Thanks, Chair. Um, yes, I would fully support this. We all have our grot spots in our various wards and areas, and I think they've become known as that. Um, it is a blight on the town, and it is a very difficult situation to, to deal with, and the Longsker is a, is a good example of how long it had taken to, to get something done about that. Um, and it took a fire, but there you go. Um, so I think that it's a very good motion. I would just go a little bit further um, rather than just writing to our MP to actually um, ask her to, to take it to Parliament. I would actually think that a letter to the minister, the appropriate minister, would be good as well <clears throat> so that he's aware or she is aware that this is going on rather than just um, leaving it to the MP. Thank you. I think that can Thanks, be Chair. copied in, can it? Yes, thank you for that. Lisa? Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Councillor Moore, for apologising for not contacting people. I know I give you quite a bit of earache um, in regards to that, so you beat me to it because I've wrote a lovely big essay down here on the reasons why you should speak to more than one person when you need a signature, because it does actually... Um, affect everybody, everybody's ward um, in relation to derelict buildings. Seaton Ward has at least three alongside the derelict land of the Longska Hall, which we are continuing to fight against. So yes, um, writing to Jill and I think um, Councillor um, Harrison um, is right in saying that we should write to the Minister because I don't believe Jill on her own actually has the power to do anything to help Hartlepool. Thank you. Jonathan? I'll reserve my comments on the MP. Um, <laughs> I just... I, what did I do? Um, sorry, sorry, Jill, clearly. Um, Works in mysterious we found her, ways. Found her. Works in mysterious um, ways. No, I, it, was just, it was actually just to highlight one, a couple of things. The first thing is it is important to recognise, and because lots of colleagues have made reference to examples of, of, of buildings, the motion says land as well, and I think it's a really important part of it. Um, I am absolutely sick to the back teeth of certain private developers land banking this town. Denise is looking at me because I'm having a long conversation with her about one particular piece of land in Burbank, as well as, uh, frankly, other bits of land as well. Um, I think we have to lead by example as well, because another piece of land that I'm having a long discussion about, we own. And I think that if we're going to put our money where our mouth is and we're going to make these demands on the private sector, we have to lead by example as well and get our house in order because there are 
patches of land in Burbank and elsewhere. They're owned by the council. They're in a sorry state. And I know the people around there want them sorted out. Um, and just on that, I absolutely can't agree any more with this motion. Everyone's already said it. But I would just say when the opportunity arises to use what leverage we have, we must maximise it. We know, and it's come up at council before, it's come up at finance and policy before, we know that the town's fund, um, over which we mostly agree, has an item in there that involves giving an enormous amount of public money to one of these private developers who's land banking all across town and leaving them derelict. We have to use every ounce of leverage at our disposal. If they want the money, they have to play ball with us. That's the way public money should be spent, for the public, not for the private developer. So I completely agree with this motion, but we must at every turn, colleagues, whenever we have an ounce that we can um, squeeze out of them, any leverage we can get, we have to use it every single time and consistently, no matter who the developer is. Thank you. Marsh. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. You probably will appreciate this more than most in the room, actually, having chaired the planning committee for many years, as I did. There are powers under the planning legislation now. They exist today to deal with many of the blights in Hartlepool. What bemuses me in many ways is why we don't use them vigorously, determinedly and constantly. Some of us with long political experience and memories will recall when we had an elected mayor. And one of the things our former elected mayor said, and he identified 10 buildings in Hartlepool, which he said were blighting our town. Well, as far as I'm aware, only one of those has now disappeared from blighting our town. The other nine continue to blight merrily and add nine more to those nine, and maybe nine more again to those nine, we're in a situation where we probably have about 35 blighting buildings in Hartlepool. So I ask why we aren't pursuing with vigor the powers we already have, and if you want to write a letter to the MP, and I am minded to uh, take the advice I've just been given that um, Jill Mortimer probably doesn't have a lot of power by herself. But we may ask why, in terms of Her Majesty's revenues and customs, that people who own blighting buildings can write off some of their tax to the value of 10% year on year. So there's no vigor involved in keeping the buildings. It's a financial gain. So maybe we should approach it, stop that, and it might be a lot less attractive to keep these buildings dropping to bits in our communities. Thank you. Councillor Brown. Thank you, De Deputy Mayor. Uh, I initially put my hand up in response to Councillor Brash to say that uh, over the last couple of months I've been tootling around the town uh, and acknowledging and recognising pieces of land and buildings that have been in an eyesore and I've had meetings with the assistant director to try and put some proposals together. Uh, not Some of it is our land, some of it isn't. If it is our land, not only is it an eyesore, it's not getting maximum profit in for the council, which is, which is one of the other things I've been looking at. Uh, and, and as I say, I stood up to address Councillor Brash, but Councillor Boddy also then spoke before me. Uh, and with the true vigour that Councillor Buddy speaks about, I noticed that uh, I was looking through some more paperwork, and there's an off officer's record of decision, de decision of record rather. Uh, and it says that uh, Summerhill is released by Councillor Buddy. And Summerhill, I believe, is also in in, in arrears on rent, Councillor Buddy. Now, this council is desperately short of money, can you answer, is it in arrears with rent or is it up to date? Thank you, Chair. I wasn't aware that we had 
permission, right or legal authority to discuss someone's Moss, personal Moss, business. Moss, can you just hang on one second, please? I'm just clarifying with Haley as to whether or not you should respond to the actual question. Okay, just bear with us. I am not going to respond to the question. Well, I don't care what the Chief Solicitor says. Well, do you mind just holding on, please? Uh, I, I do appreciate that you said you're not responding and I've uh, been advised by Haley that you do not have to respond anyway. So, um, Councillor Brown. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Could I also ask Councillor Boddy why the leasehold of that isn't on his declaration, declaration of interests? Would he, would he care to answer that question? Again, Mr. Mayor, Deputy Mayor, I think that's a matter for councillor body. He doesn't have to answer that during this meeting. Right. I've been advised that uh, councillor body doesn't have to answer that in this meeting. Uh, there will be other appropriate times in which you could ask that question, but not at this council meeting. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, can I, I I'll just go on with the number of people that I've got down and then I can come back to you, Councillor Boddy. Uh, Mike. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Um, I found it quite good that you got a drum roll there, Councillor Brash. That was uh, impressive. Um, on Councillor Boddy's uh, comments about uh, the planning uh, department not taking more rigorous action, I think it's a historic thing. I don't think any chair uh, previously uh, has, has been that vigorous uh, and you said you were included in that, so it would be interesting to know what I'll be interested to know what vigorous measures were taken when you were chair, and and if Councillor Cook wants to feed in, that'd be great as well. Uh, it is a point I will take forward, though. Uh, the final thing I would say is 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 on the motion. Um, could we send a list of the properties that are on that are a blight, uh, and can we make sure that there is a. a at least some details about what condition they're in and what progress uh, is being made, if any. Uh, in terms of enforcement or, or, or other action. Are you suggesting, uh, Council, that the, um, the motion should be amended to include the buildings themselves? If that's, if that's OK, yeah. Is that OK with you? Yeah, yeah thank you for that. Uh, just bear with me, Peter, please. Did you want to come back, John, or not? I will do. Yeah, I will do. Um, I know Councillor Brown, I'm sure you felt that was an incredibly well-planned gotcha moment for a member of the council, and I'm sure you're very proud of your efforts in preparing for it. Can I just make the general point that this, this is the politics we don't need? I'm sure if anyone's got an issue with someone's declaration of interest or anything like that, they're free to avail themselves of the chief solicitor in the normal way. Indeed, I've had issues with members opposite, which I have raised privately with the Chief Solicitor in a constructive, mature way. Um, we can be better than this. And I think the only person who's come out of this worse is the person who asked the questions. Moss, you wish to come back? Thank you, Deputy Mayor. You may recall, I'm sure you do, on the 21st of December, when we had a council meeting here, I was probably sitting more or less where I'm sitting this evening. And across from me was the towering intellect of Cow Councillor Brown. And he was making infantile comments about the mask I was wearing. And I asked him if he was medically qualified. And of course, he isn't medically qualified. And therefore, I pointed out that as I had a medical condition, it was none of his business. He is now, tonight, attempting to besmirch my character once again. Now, if he wants to play infantile politics, most, most, it proves most. he has an infantile brain. And if he goes any further, I will be seeking legal advice. Thank you. It was totally uncalled for. Um, 
I, I don't like this when we're going backwards and forwards. I give you the opportunity to speak, but let's not get personal and whatever, you, as you've already mentioned, Jonathan. Can we just please act with a bit of decorum? Okay? We still have a couple of members who wish to speak on this particular uh, motion. So, Peter. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to take it further from what Councillor Young was saying, and it, it crossed my mind before he started to speak, actually, and it's not on the motion itself, it's on the number of properties and land that does blight this town. And I think it would be useful if all of the ward councillors could feed into a register where we can actually keep control of what we're doing for each property, what we're doing for each piece of land, whether we take in action and how we take it forward. And I'd like to see that register probably looked at every quarter. Now, whether that's by finance and policy or by whoever in the council, uh, planning department, whoever it is, but I'd like to see that register. Uh, let's get it put into place and let's see what action we are taking. There is uh, a register, actually, of, of these uh, said buildings, so yes, that can be done. Okay. Uh, I will move on to our next speaker, please. Uh, people have been waiting for quite a while, so Rachel. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, actually, I've, I sought advice from the authority a, a few months ago um, around a register of empty properties, and I was told that there was no register of empty properties. So I'm not sure where we're going to compile this list from. There definitely is, Rachel. Right. I Chair, Chair, just to confirm that I receive a regular report on derelict buildings, and I'm happy for that to maybe go to one of the committees that we can then consider going forward. I'm a little bit and concerned as to why I wasn't given that information. I don't I know who you asked, Councillor Creevy, so if you I'll wish take to it up outside the meeting with you yeah, and deal with it. wish to speak to Denise afterwards, okay, then she'll look you. into that, Rachel. Thank you. Uh, Cameron. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Was just on that point. There is regular. Uh, the chair of neighbourhoods and regular services has regular updates on these derelict buildings, and the list of derelict buildings is updated. So, if one becomes more of a priority or it deteriorates more quickly, that will move further up on the list. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Shane. Are we standing or not? Right. Thank you, Chair. Um, it was just really to round up the debate and speak to close. Um, I'm happy to take the, uh, the suggestion from, forgive me, I forget if it was Councillor Hargreaves or Harrison who asked, uh, Councillor Harrison, sorry about adding uh, everybody's name. No problem with that at all. And I'm happy for us to uh, add the list to the letter that gets sent as well. And just to, to continue on. Uh, with the list of the derelict buildings. I just wonder, ch um, Chair, with the Managing Director, if for the next Members' Seminar we can potentially bring that list forward and we can bring everybody up to speed so we all know yeah. where we are and do a bit of a stop take. Yes, agreed. Yeah. Okay. Right. If there's no further comments to be made, um, everybody's basically agreed to uh, the motion. Um, but do we, it's just a show of hands in this particular case. As long as there's no dissent. As long as there's no dissent. Can we just have a show of hands, please, all those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, colleagues. We'll move on to uh, receive the Managing Director's report. You'll be glad to know she's got three of them. Four. Oh, no, sorry. On table. sorry. I do apologise, Chair, but the Prime Minister did make an announcement to COVID changes this week, which, made, which meant I had to change my uh, COVID update. So um, I'll go through each one and then stop after each um, section. So um, I have received notification from Councillor Picton that he wishes to resign from Police and, Pri Police and Crime Panel, and a replacement has been sought, and I've been advised that Councillor Shane Moore will take up that seat. Okay. It's their, their seat. So that's just for note. Thank yeah. you. Um, special urgency decisions in accordance with the requirements of the access to information procedure world rules. Uh, there was one special urgency decision that was taken in the period November to January, and this was to um, procure a specialist external support 
um, regarding project management and technical advisory services to deliver five Green Book compliant business cases regarding the Town Fund programme. This work was, has needed to be undertaken urgently to ensure that the allocation of 25 million can be drawn down within the uh, appropriate time period. Thank you. Okay. Um, the COVID update, Chair. Since writing the report. Um, sorry. I've, sorry, Chair. It was. Yes, Brenda, yes. Thanks, Chair. Um, it was just to ask. Why do we have to go to external support? Have we not got internal expertise that we could use? Uh, and sadly, because of the fabulous regeneration programme we've got, we don't have an, sufficient staff within the area, uh, within our own department, because they're absolutely flat out on our own capital regeneration programme. The additional work that we're getting with the funding needs external resource, but what I can tell you is this company is a Tees Valley company, so it's actually a neighbouring uh, company. Okay. Yes, Ben. Thanks, Deputy Mayor. Um, I know within the report, um, it informs us of a special urgency decision taken between November and January, which seems quite a lengthy period. Um, I also note within the report, there's no mention of the sale of Rockhaven, which was decided on the 2nd of December, and members didn't find out about it until the 16th of January when it was made public. So my question for the Managing Director is, why is it that some decisions don't seem to be disseminated to members in a timely fashion and can the process please be reviewed so that that does happen? So under the constitution officers have delegations up to a certain amount so the sale of Rockhaven is actually delegated to myself under a certain limit. The, this um, decision was actually over that amount which is why it's classed as an urgent decision and has to come to council. So if you, the delegations um, could be looked at again However, my advice would be not to unpick that because you, it would prove very difficult and sometimes we have to act at pace, which is why that um, decision was made. Um, I know that if you wish that to happen, we do an annual review of the constitution and that could be proposed and we could take it forward as part of that review. Okay, Jonathan. I may have misunderstood Councillor Clayton's question. I don't actually think he was asking to unpick what powers are delegated. He was talking about the timely nature in which it's disseminated to members. The decision was taken on the 2nd of December and members weren't told about it until the 17th of January. Surely there must be a mechanism to make that quicker. I, I, I think as, just so we have the information, I think it was all that, asking. Is that what you were trying to clarify, Ben? Yes, uh, Deputy Mayor, that was what I was trying to clarify, and um, particularly since we had a council meeting on the 16th of December, which was two weeks after the decision. Right. Okay. Thank Apologies, you. Councillor Clayton, for uh, misinterpreting what you said. Thank you, Councillor Brash, for uh, clarifying that. Um, the decision records are made, and, some, and then they have to be signed, and then put on the internet and registered with legal as well, and sometimes that does take a couple of weeks. I take on board the thing that we need to actually inform members um, more quicker. And we do put them on our websites, but we will look to improve that where we can. Okay. Can we move on then to next one? Yes, yeah, section three of the COVID update. Um, this was written before the announcements. So um, if I take members to the business report four, which was tabled when you uh, came in this evening, um, you'll be fully aware of the Prime Minister's announcement that we have to learn to live with COVID. And there's been a, a government document uh, produced, which we've been working through um, to actually get the detail. The document sets out how the government will ensure resilience, maintaining contingency capabilities to deal with a range of COVID scenarios. Um, it also summarises a number, well, I've tried to summarise a number of the key points in the table at the end of the document. Key point I would um, inform members out because I don't want to go through it. I know you've, um, I've given you a chance to read it and more than happy to answer any questions either tonight or later. The key point is whilst the health protection measures or restrictions as they're called um, have been withdrawn from today, under health and safety legislation they are still in force until the 1st of April. So if we have an outbreak in the council, it is a RIDO reportable incident and therefore as head of paid service, I have a duty to protect the staff and make sure that we um, reduce any opportunities of um, COVID outbreaks in this, across staff. So it's just for members to 
if they get um, concerned why we might be seen to be a bit more stringent compared to other areas I do have a health and safety duty so it's just to inform members of that I can give you an update on the vaccinations uh, we now have 83% um, of um, the population have their first dose 80% had their second and 62% have had their third happy to answer any questions on COVID chair yeah uh, uh, yes Rachel Sorry, I just wonder whether, whether the council... Oh, do I need to stand? No. Yeah, yeah. All right, I won't bother. Okay. Um, I wondered whether there's um, quite a lot of misinformation going out there about the, um, a, the need to self-isolate once someone's had a positive test. I just wondered whether the council's planning to do some um, information sharing, really, with members of the public to tell them that they can still, they just, it's advised that they still have to self, or they still can self-isolate. No, um, it's, a, it's a really good point, Councillor Creevy, and yes, we will be, because whilst the requirement, uh, that the message from government or the message that came out of the announcements was that you don't have to self-isolate, and it's been that, or if you're symptomatic or tested positive has been removed, it hasn't. It's still advisory and it's really important that we get the message out and I know the comms team are working really closely with the Director of Public Health to make sure we get a clear message out because it is really complex. It is advisory now that you should if you test positive or have symptoms or live with someone within the five days. So it's a very good point, Chan. Thank you. Okay. Come in. Come in. Um, there is a question I'd like to ask actually. I was speaking to um, one of our officers today and she informed me that her vulnerable child who is over five years of age uh, wanted to get her vaccinated because children are vulnerable can get a vaccination and children between five and eleven can get a vaccination yet there was nowhere in Hartlepool that was available she contacted her own doctors she was told to go to a walkthrough, etc., etc., and each time she went, she was told there was none available. I find that rather perturbing, um, considering it's out there and the government had said that that is possible. So can we have some form of um, check on why this isn't happening in Harley? Yes, Chair, I know um, myself on it to get my boost right to go out of town as well, so I appreciate that, the, the concern. So I'll speak to the Director of Public Health and find out what we can do about improving the capacity in the uh, vaccination centres. Okay, thank you. Right, do you want to move on to the next one then, please? Um, so this is the net zero and climate change strategy. Um, members are asked to note that at finance and policy on the 13th of December, members approved a proposal to develop um, such a climate change plan and it was a response in a mo to a motion that came to full council on the 30th of July 2020. The report set out a proposed timetable between now and September 22, which will see the development of the council's first net zero plan. Members were quite clean to make sure that we actually came up with our own language rather than um, have some tokenism towards climate emergency. And um, what isn't included in this report is that we would actually be going live with our climate pledge in the next couple of weeks. The members will be notified of that in due course. Okay. Um, okay. Item five, uh, levelling up feedback. Um, we are pleased to advise members that we finally had a meeting with the officers from Dulux. Sorry, Dulux, whatever you say, beers. And I can advise there are nothing significantly wrong with our bid. And if we'd have had the adequate time, our schemes would have been more advanced and would have filled most of the gaps on the uh, criteria checklist, such as strategic fit, value for money, deliverability, and characteristics of place. So there were no elements of the bid that were weak, nor areas that were not covered for the information provided. The overall feedback was given in, further, in more detail at the time, and I'm happy to share that with members if they would like that. I've just summarized it here. The good thing about the feedback is it's put us in a good stead for round two um, to make sure that we uh, cover all the key areas. I would also advise that there were over 300 bids submitted and 200 were rejected, so we weren't on our own. Okay, Jonathan. Thanks, Chair. Um, 
it, would it be possible for the managing director, first of all, just to, to advise on the timelines now in terms of the round two bid? Um, and that before any bid is submitted, actually, not necessarily in a full council meeting or anything like that, but we put a working group together that allows all members to feed into the process to see that final bid in its draft form before it's submitted and so we can be fully involved right across because it's an issue that's far too important for party politics. So I, I'm sure you'd be supportive of that. So, so we're still, you won't be surprised, we're, we're still awaiting the timeline. Um, we had notified it's spring and I, I don't disagree and I think we can um, bring it to a member's seminar and have that full debate there. Did you wish to speak, Pam? No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. Next one. Um, the election hearing petition, a High Court hearing was held in the Civic Centre on the 27th and 28th of January. Consider a petition issued by Mr. Robert Buchan against Councillor Jennifer Elliott. His Honour, Judge Kramer, uh, considered the evidence before him and gave his um, judgment and Councillor Jennifer Elliott was duly elected. Um, his Honour thanked Hartlepool Borough Council for the very efficient way in which this was organised. Just to inform members, this is the first time they've ever come out of High Court and Hartlepool another first for us. So. Um, and what was really encouraging was the uh, support and thanks that was given not only from Judge Kramer but also uh, the barrister and her support team and not just to the officers but was one specific, specific officer was named and you won't be surprised to hear that it was Jackie Allen. In fact, not for the minutes. The judge did say that every time he emptied his cup of coffee, it suddenly just appeared a next one. <laughs> I've always said questions? she's the backbone of this council. So, yes. Yes, Jennifer. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I just wanted to express some thanks as well. Um, I am, of course, delighted with the result, and I'm happy that a very stressful period of my life has been brought to a close. Um, I just wanted to echo Denise's sentiments, uh, particularly about Jackie, who was absolutely fantastic. Um, there's a lot of people who really went above and beyond uh, to make sure that the proceedings went smoothly. So I just wanted to take a bit of time just to express my really sincere thanks to the staff of Hartlepool Borough Council, especially those in member services, and particularly to Lorraine Benison. Uh, Lorraine was absolutely fantastic, she went out of her way to assist, even made sure that my parents were taken care of as it was their first visit to Hartlepool Civic Centre. Um, thanks also to uh, Denise and Haley. Um, you were helpful and professional right from the beginning and I'm sure that you made everything run very smoothly, so thank you for that. Um, the Labour Group as well, uh, I'd like to thank, they stood by me. Um, and supported me from day one, and I couldn't have done it without them. I'm proud to call them my colleagues and my friends, and I couldn't wish for a better support system. Thanks also to other councillors outside of the Labour Group who reached out to me, and also to councillors both past and present who felt able to take two days from their busy schedules to observe from the public gallery. I'm glad to put this behind me and get back to what really matters, the residents of my ward and the advancement of the borough as a whole. I hope to be able to continue that work for a long time to come. So thank you to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, item seven of my report is to advise and inform members that the parish liaison meetings have been reintroduced, inviting all parish council chairs to attend, along with myself and the leader of the council, providing an equal opportunity for all parish chairs to share their aspirations or concerns uh, for the borough and also for the council to give uh, the parish councils an update on the council's key deliverables. Can I just ask if they have accepted and are willing to do that? Um, one parish council has attended and has been accepted and I received notification today um, despite it being in the Hartlepool Mail two weeks ago that, they won't, that four other parishes do not intend to um, attend the parish liaison meetings and still have a vote of no confidence. Okay, thank you. Item eight of the report, Chair, talks about the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, uh, a full year of celebration ahead of us. Um, we started this process on Saturday the 5th of February and we are planning to host a, a year of celebrations interacting with local heritage, education, community and businesses 
Book of Commemoration uh, will be opened um, this month, if it hasn't already, and a range of campaigns and events are organised. And we will be uh, putting something on the intranet and internet and also doing some work with members to inform them how the communities can get involved in that because I know there's a number looking at street closures, um, street parties which will involve road closures so that information will be coming out soon. Okay. Right, next one please. Item 9, members will recall at the last meeting of the committee held on the 22nd of November it was agreed that the recommendation be made that the election cycle be changed to a whole council elections from effect from May 2024. The Local Government and Public Involvement in Health Act 2007 requires that full council pass a resolution to consult such persons as the council think appropriate to move to council elections. This um, consultation is underway. Once completed, a special meeting of full council is required to be convened for a motion that must then be approved by two-thirds majority of members voting. Arrangements have therefore been made for a special meeting of council to be held on the 24th of March, immediately prior to our scheduled ordinary meeting of full council, to make sure we get it in this financial municipal year. Okay. No comments? Thank you. Sorry. Yes. Can you use your microphone, please? I'd just like to ask you if we can get the... The, the survey out further because Steve was at a residence meeting today and he got loads of grief about this uh, mm. this vote we'll push vote it out again vote. on our social media comms we have been pushing it out but we'll um, get it out and we can look at putting it in the paper if we haven't already I, mean, I, I assume it would be for it but uh, it does close in three not. days <laughs> just so you're aware but we've got three days it has been out for eight weeks now yeah, yeah it finishes on the 27th so Yes, uh, Dave. Yeah, the, the residence meeting today, somebody brought it up, and uh, I was unprepared for, for the onslaught, to be honest. It was the first time I'd ever been backed into a corner. Uh, and they were saying that they'd voted for me to, to represent them, and they're totally against that idea. And I turned around and said that it was put out, that the information was out there, but a lot of them are old and say they don't have... The, the internet, they don't have social media and stuff like that, so in their words, how the hell do we know? I can only um, so, uh, advise that we have been pushing this out there for eight weeks, and it's the first complaint I've had, so I do apologise that that's happened, but um, we'll, we can get some information to your council of Picton for you to go to the resident association. Uh, just to advise, you can go back to your residence that you will be f completing your full term before if if this motion is carried to actually go so it wouldn't affect the term that you were elected okay mike uh, yes deputy chairman can i just ask councillor picton uh, a, a fairly straightforward question did they talk to you about it did they bring it up yes. so how did they know about it because <laughs> i've just said they don't know about it but then they brought it up with yourself Sorry, the, the chair of the meeting brought it up in front of everybody and I was unaware that he was going to do it. And there was an, an ex-councillor there that was just stirring the pot and I was just really, really backed into a corner. Okay, noted. Denise, do you want I, to... I can confirm it has been in the mail. I've just, had it com I've just seen the emails and everything. So it was in the Hartlepool mail and the Hartlepool yeah. live. In the what? <laughs> yes, John. <coughs> I do think it's important when that meeting comes that we actually do have the figures for the number of people who responded to the consultation because we, we, we can preempt it now. It isn't going to be high and I'm afraid that seems to be the nature of a lot of these consultations but we need to know that when we have our discussion today. I mean I have my view on the issues well known I'm thoroughly in favour but I think it's important to have those demographics for the consultation because it will be disappointing, let's all be honest about it, in terms of how many people actually have responded to that survey. It would yeah, the figures will be included in the report, um, but we do check it daily, and I wouldn't I, disagree. I just mentioned that all members uh, were asked to go and do the survey. Uh, if you haven't done so, will you please do so before the 27th? Yes, Ben. 
When that report is brought forward um, with the numbers of people that have voted, is it possible to get a demographic breakdown so we can see that if, if we're missing like a large section of, of a particular class of people? If, if we can do that, if that's included in the consultation, then we will provide that. Depends what was involved in the consultation. I haven't got that with me, Councillor Clayton. Okay. Can you move on to your next one? Please? So, um, the next item is the pay policy under Section 38 of the Localism Act 2011. Full Council has to approve the uh, pay policy on an annual basis. Um, so, I'd need Council, this one isn't to note, this is to ask, for, to ask Full Council to approve the pay policy statement which is attached to Appendix A. You've got questions? Sorry, Pam. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, oh, hello. Then he fell over. It's deceptively flat. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about the policy statement, the peer policy statement. In terms of um, how uh, amendable it is, how whether there are there are options for us to tinker a little bit with it, as a, and depending on the answer to that, I might have a second question, if I may, Chair. Certainly. Um, I've told members to uh, section 6 of the report which has got the additional benefits in it I can advise that um, when we review this uh, the local pension scheme um, percentage of pensionable pay was reviewed and there was no change teachers pension of pay same but the NHS pension scheme changed from to 14.3% it was originally 20.68 I know that doesn't answer your report fully but um, it does demonstrate that there is some flexibility within that um, for members. Yes, Pam. I'm just, um, the reason I'm asking that is I'm just obviously mindful of the, um, the discussion that took place at Finance and Policy and the, um, the proposal that was hoped would form part of the medium-term financial strategy but couldn't because of the timings. Um, and this is obviously those who were there will, will know that this relates to the, um, the changes to terms and conditions for the people who are the least um, well paid in, in the authority. And I'm just wondering whether, given that we've got this pay policy, whether actually, A, whether if we go ahead with that decision, that has an impact in terms of the multipliers. Um, and secondly, if, um, if it if we are going to implement that, is, there, is this the opportunity for us to maybe reconsider that and have some thought about that? I mean, I did ask the um, Chief Financial Officer for some um, further clarification because I was struggling with my hearing on that day. Um, but the information that he provided was that those members who were affected by that potential buyout are actually the least well paid in the authority. And it seems strange that at a time when we've got our senior leadership of the the council fighting tooth and nail to retain every single penny of their SRAs, that actually what we're doing once again is taking the money to support budget deficit from those who can least afford it. I mean, tonight we've put council tax up. I'm sorry to repeat all these. We've put council tax up. They're getting a 10% national insurance increase. We've got um, rising rent now, we've got, uh, which I've just added to this list because we've just agreed it. We've got fuel costs that are increasing. We've got cost of living increases. Mobile phone, I've mentioned broadband that we're going up. We've got all the food crisis. I mean, we've got literally increases everywhere. And yet we seem to think that the best way to try and bridge some of that budget deficit, which I accept is, you know, we, I wish we didn't have them. And maybe if we changed the government, we wouldn't have as big a deficit. Um, but I'm just, I'm hoping that this might be an opportunity for us to go back and have those conversations again with the Trade Unions Council and the employees and see if we can't come back with a better option than taking the money from the least well off and the least paid in the authority to prop up our budget, if possible. So, um, in, to respond to the actual pay policy, this is applied to all um, employees. Um, my recollection of finance and policy, and I know the minutes haven't been published yet, my recollection was that I was tasked to re-enter and nego renegotiate with the trade unions, which we are about to start next week. Well, the decision was that you would start to renegotiate if you come to an agreement, then we would actually implement the savings that was actually originally agreed back in December. Yes. Oh 
We will come back to finance and policy with, um, with an update on the negotiations. Okay. Chair, I do apologise. Um, going to the business report two, which is the Treasury Management Strategy under the Local Government Act 2003. We are required that the Council determine a Treasury Management Strategy for borrowing and to prepare an annual investment strategy, which sets out our policies for managing investment and giving priority to security and liquid liquidity of these investments. Council is required to nominate a body to be responsible for ensuring effective scrutiny of the Treasury management strategy and policies, and this is allocated to the Audit and Governance Committee. The uh, recommendation from the strategy that this was considered by Audit and Governance on the 10th of February, and the report is attached for members' uh, consideration. The members are asked to note the report on the recommendation for Audit and Governance to approve the, final, the following detailed recommendations as set out um, in the report. Yeah. Any comments? No. Thank you. And and finally, okay. Thank you, Chair. It's, apologies, it's uh, the McGuckin Roger. Uh, business report three. This is the Council Tax Demand Notices and Reduction Schemes England Amendment Regulations 2022, known as the 150 pounds energy uh, refund. So um, we have to come to uh, Council for this to be accepted. So the details are included in the report. The reg regulations cover £150 Council tax energy bills rebate for Council tax bans A to D, and regulations also amend the Council tax reduction schemes um, regulations that were required from the 1st of April of this year. All Council tax support schemes must disregard energy bills rebate payments in determining a person's eligibility the council tax reduction and the amount of any such reduction. Approval of this amendment is now required from council in order to meet the statutory deadline of the 11th of March. Is there any comments or dissent? Thank and you. and you'll you. be pleased to hear, Chair, that's me done. Are you sure? I hope so. Do you want to double check? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Denise. <laughs> Thank you. Right, uh, that takes care of item um, 13. We'll go to 14, and there's questions from and provide answers to the public in relation to matters of which notice has been given under Rule 9. Denise. Apologies, Chair. The uh, member of the public who asked this question has not come up tonight, so I have to ask the question. Um, I can ask it in full, or can I actually just go to the... Uh, the bit that's in the middle and the bit in the middle hopefully there's no dissent because we're all freezing the question is that full council will Hartlepool council finally start to rethink its policy on local council tax support in that carers should now be fully excluded from having to pay a shortfall in their council tax bills I'm assuming everybody has read uh, the document so that's the reason that uh, Denise has given the little relevant part yeah thank yeah. you chair yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, unfortunately, since it is a response, I will have to read out in full. Um, can I thank Ms. Hyam for her question and also express my appreciation for the role our carers play in supporting their loved ones and other people that they support? The Council has maintained a 12% local council tax support scheme for nine years, uh, and we recognise this support is needed by many, many people. Whilst I support the 12% scheme, it needs to be recognised that this support reduces the amount of council tax we receive to pay for services uh, as fully eligible households only have to pay 12% of the council tax liability. I believe the existing means-tested local council tax support scheme provides a fair basis for supporting households and a blanket exemption for carers would not be appropriate. Indeed, Chair, should a blanket exemption be put in place, for all carers, that would mean that my own household uh, would, be, uh, would have to pay no council tax, and I don't think that's very appropriate, given that I can quite clearly uh, pay our bills. The council, um, sorry, it's my understanding that no other Tees Valley Council has gone down this route and assessing local council tax support, and, and do assess local council tax support on a means-tested basis. The Council has always acknowledged the vital role that carers play in supporting family members or friends who have uh, support needs and commission care, uh, commissions carer assessment, information and support for Hartlepool carers 
which can involve practical as well as emotional support. The Council also supports carers by providing <coughs> direct payments that can be used innovatively by carers in ways that make it possible for them to continue in their caring role and commission services that provide carers with short breaks from their caring responsibilities. And we'll send a copy of this out to Ms Hyde. Okay, thank you. <coughs> any, any comments? No? Right, thank you for that, Shane. We will move on. Oh, sorry, Rachel. Thanks, Rob. Um, can I just ask how many, how many people might be impacted by this? And can we not explore how many people might be impacted by this? I haven't got that figure with me, Councillor Creevy, but I can get it to you. Brenda? Thanks. Um, sorry. I think this is the tip of the iceberg, actually, because I think there's an awful lot of people who do a caring role. You, you've just you know, um, highlighted yourself, Shane, but I think there's people who give up work in order to be a carer, but don't necessarily register as a carer because they just see it as part of their family duty to do that. So I do actually think, I, I would imagine that it's quite difficult to get figures as such because there's so many. Um, and, and I would hope that those people who perhaps just for want of a better way of putting it, think that it's a, a kind of duty um, to, to be doing this and are not looking for any kind of um, financial support or anything, I, I would hope that that support is there for them, even if it's not financial, but, it, but a kind of, uh, what's the other word? Um, Non-financial. <laughs> I can't think of the word, but uh, you know, to actually support them in what they do um, it's a very important job and it saves a lot of money from the NHS and, and wherever. So I do think that this is a, a group of people that need to be looked at a little bit more carefully and we need to do a bit more digging. Thanks. Okay. Yes, Rachel. I do feel rather than just dismissing it out of hand that we could maybe, um, can we not suggest that it goes to a committee to be, to be explored a little bit further rather than just dismissing it? Chair, I can come back to that. I mean, Councillor Harrison's quite right. We'll only know what we know. There'll be a lot of carers out there. We're not afford about when we can on. I'll speak to the Director of Adult and Community Prevention Service, Preventative Community Services to see if we can actually bring something forward. Um, we'll try and get it in the next agenda, but I know it's quite full, so we'll see if we... We, will, we won't lose sight of it, though. Mike? I think it's an it's a, it's a interesting debate and it's one that I, I support uh, the discussion of. Um, my mother is a, is a carer for, for my dad um, and she's absolutely terrified of anything to do with money and, 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 and things like that. So I think there's also an education element to go with that. So what you've just said there, Councillor Harrison, I think it's not just about us being insular and talking internally about what we might or might not be able to do. I think there's a whole spectrum of education that probably needs to be put out there to stop terrifying people about their, about their budgets. Because um, I know, my, even though I try and reassure my mum all the time, she's very, very, very uh, worried about the, 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 the internal workings of, of, of budgets. Okay, thank you. Any further comments? Yes, Chair. Just to finish, Chair, I think it, it, I, I did mention it in the response as well, but just to any member or any, anybody who has any family or friends who are, play a caring role, I would seriously suggest signposting them towards Hartlepool Carers. They do an amazing job of supporting not only paid carers, but also uh, those non-registered carers as well, because they, they can and will help people um, in, in an incredible amount. Well, I think everybody would be aware that there are a number of children who are carers for their parents, who uh, do it for the love of their parents and don't get any remuneration or help of any description, which I think is a sad state of affairs. But it is something that we really need to look into. You, you raise a, 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 an important point that there are a lot of young people, so I'll speak to the director of children's, and it might be that we can. I know we're not allowed to do joint committees. We can have one committee that invites the other members to it constitutionally, but you know what I mean. Yes. So we can look at that. Okay. Thank you. Can we move on then, colleagues, um, to item 15? Answer questions of members of the council under Rule 10. A. Are there any questions without notice to uh, chairs of committees? 
Yes, Pam. It's all me tonight, isn't it? Sorry. Um, I just wanted to ask a, a question to the Chair of the Finance and Policy Committee, if I may. Um, just on the, uh, the recent meeting on the, uh, the decision around the, um, the terms and conditions of uh, members of staff, um, and I just wondered, just quite simply really, does he think it's fair that we are trying to bridge some of the budget deficit by taking the money from the least well off, and would he not think it more fair if we were to start from the top and everybody make a contribution to the budget deficit for next for the next financial year. Can I just bring Haley? Yeah, I'm sorry to interject, um, but we can only, members can only ask questions what if the pub the minutes have been published um, from the meeting that you're asking a question about, and they've not the finance and policy minutes have not yet been published. Oh right, look at it. Thank, thank you. Um, I mean, as it's a moral question, the, the leader of the council might, you know, through leadership, want to answer that anyway. But I, I accept that. I mean, obviously, it's, it's open for him to decide. Okay. Thank. Thanks for the clarification. There. Uh, if there are no others, can we move on to? You don't. I don't mind re replying, Chair. Um, oh, right. Just, I just make two points that um, decisions were taken in previous budgets to take money from the top. In fact, senior management costs were reduced by, someone will correct me if I'm wrong, by about 7%. The managing director position, when we went through the restructure, is now on a fixed point basis as well. So uh, savings were made at the top. And in relation to the terms and condition changes, I appreciate uh, the comments made by Councillor Hargreaves, but in a previous finance and policy meeting, she actually agreed with us that the terms and conditions needed changing and that it was bizarre that we were still operating and paying people time and a half when they started their first shift on Saturday. Okay. Just, just on a point of personal clarification, I didn't agree to that at all. I did not agree to that. Well, I'm sure the minutes of the meeting, when they are published, will be very clear. I have never agreed to that, Chair, which we'll point out probably at the next Council meeting as a retraction. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, um, <clears throat> excuse me, under 15B, we, don't, we have none, no questions. Um, item C, we have none. Uh, it's item D is the minutes of Cleveland Fire Authority, just to be noted, and they be so noted. Yep, thank you. Right, uh, that concludes um, the meeting for this evening and I will close the meeting at 7.43. Thank you everybody for your attendance. I ho just hope that our next meeting is in the council chamber where it will be a damn sight warmer than it is in here. <laughs> <laughs>